Thanks, everybody. Very pleased to be here and uh, glad to have some chats with folks earlier in the day. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about digital work, my own approach to it, but also how I use it in teaching. I've been teaching at Mizzou since 2007. I earned my, my BFA at School of the Art Institute of Chicago in 2001, and um, then I went to Indiana University for my graduate program. And sort of professionally, I've been doing stuff online and working digitally since 2014, but I actually began much longer ago than that. I actually took a class in Photoshop too back at the School of the Art Institute. And back then we were using Wacom tablets and other input devices. But eventually, by the time I was building this online beginning drawing and then color drawing for an online or remote situation, I was using primarily iPads. I also incorporate into my own work CNC routers, CNC, larger CNC tools, um, X and Y plotters that are smaller. And I've got some pictures of how those things work and then also laser engraving for a number of things. But I couldn't be super exhaustive in this. I didn't want to overdo it, so I'm going to try to keep it a little bit under control. But to go back to the late 90s, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I got to be where I am. But basically what I did back in 97, 98, 99 is I took cheap inkjet printers like this one, which is a Canon, just cheapos. They were like 50 bucks, right? This is back when we had circuit cities and stuff like this. And I would actually crack the case on them and modify the amount of thickness that I could get into them. And I was printing out onto canvas and then sealing them and working back over the top. So from the very beginning, I was using Photoshop to manipulate the images, print them out on in situations like this and getting images kind of like this one. And they're, they're, they're small, they're, they're eight and a half by 11, they're eight by 10, they're small, I'm cutting them down, but I'm doing some digital manipulation in Photoshop, then printing them out, sealing them with matte medium, and then painting back into them. So generally, what I did back then was the beginning of how I start to think about things now. And that process, that iterative process of working it digitally, printing it out, adjusting it, and repainting it, and things like that, is something that I've done going forward. But my approach to using these tools is in teaching, exploration, and staging. And essentially, teaching is where I comment and edit and work on things. I can do demos in front of my students up on the screen. They can see it happening in real time. I can do all this stuff. I can also edit their work, right? So when they submit it to me, I can adjust it and transform it and show them examples of what it looks like in different formats. And it's another way for them to see what's happening. I also really like that in terms of teaching, um, I tend to have them use Procreate, so then I have them export not only a still image, but also the video of how they've built it. Then I can actually talk to them individually about the choices they made all the way through the work, which is something that I really enjoy doing. In terms of exploration, it's kind of replaced my sketchbook. I still do a lot of physical sketching, but it's been a way for me to walk around, have my iPad all the time, and do this work. And this is something that I'm sure for most of you is pretty common and basic. For me, it's something that makes it seamless to go from an idea to a finished work very quickly. I can come up with an idea, build it out, print it that afternoon on the big format printer at school, and then be painting on it that night. So it's like a whole process that used to take a much longer. I can do it very quickly now. And then in terms of staging, that's where I'm taking something that could be natively digital, Maybe I'm going to leave it natively digital. Maybe it's going to live online. Maybe it's going to live in a screen. Or I can transform it and let it become the substrate for what's going to be a physical work. So these are just some examples of the kinds of things that I do. Leave specific notes. I talk about specific elements that are happening in the field of view. And I'll do this at the beginning, like when we're doing very basic stuff and beginning drawing. And that way they can see directly, and then I, ha I don't have to do it as much later on because they're, they're seeing some of those examples. And then, of course, it's in, in a lot of ways, it can seem, in this situation where I'm showing it to you, it could seem kind of pedantic and, and over the top to say, this is wrong or this is right. But for me, it's more like I know that what I want them to get to is their eye being the standard. And the only way to get there is for them to have some experiences where they can reflect and to see where they've done something a certain way and we can talk it through. 
So I'll incorporate photography, I'll incorporate using their phone as a, as a viewfinder, all kinds of things like that in order to do this. Using Procreate to build the scene, show them some of these values, but then also give them a schematic. So thinking about different amounts of pressure, all this type of stuff that we would do, we would talk about in an analog situation, I can do it digitally as well. So in terms of how I'm teaching, I'm teaching everything from big interior, exterior spaces. This is a pretty large appropriate drawing of Hitch Street Garage at Mizzou, looking out at the new Sinkfield Music Building. Still lives, and in fact, this is a project where I have my students change the relationships halfway through, so they build it, and then they change the setup, and then they continue to draw and, and have their drawing reflect the new reality. And so I have an entire video showing or the mat case closed, standing up, and the cow fully inflated, and then slowly over time, it kind of deflated and the entire system changed, the entire structure changed. I continue to draw that and you see the change happen across the video. So that they're thinking about drawing is not just a snapshot, but as a temporal thing happening over time. This is a, another thing that I do a lot of is interior spaces. Back in 2016, actually this month in 2016, I had a heart attack and uh, I had cardiac arrest and I was in the hospital for a long time. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was not feeling quite right, so I thought I would go into the hospital overnight and have them check me out. So I figured I would do a demo while I was there. So I did a, I did a pretty in intensive demo with the video so I could keep talking to my students about what I was doing even though I was incapacitated in the uh, cardiac ICU. All kinds of fun there. So I also do things like portraits. Obviously we've got, there's Willie over there. Thinking about how to approach portraiture using photography, using multiple sources, using uh, a range of editing techniques so that it's not just one way of getting there. So in both of these situations, there's a, a source image, there's a source photograph, but I'm taking that and I'm transforming that in significant ways, drawing back in, painting back in, and adjusting it so that uh, I'm getting something different than what would be there just in the photograph. These are digital paintings as well. So this is a layering effect where there's some elements that are graphic and some elements that are more painterly. So I'm playing back and forth between what's drawing, what's painting, how we get the layers, how we get the transparencies. All those things are important to me in terms of how I demonstrate these things. And then I also do a lot of stuff working from casts. We've got a big cast collection at Mizzou. I think that there's something intriguing about the cast. They, uh, you know, so much of Western art history has this, still, this notion of whiteness as this uh, ideal, when actually none of these things were white. They were, they were all painted. We know the polychrome was on them. But it's very interesting to engage with that history and to get to talk to students about it, while at the same time, thinking about these forms, thinking about that long history of how people have contemplated these forms, and then also subverting them with our own work. And then just sketching, right? I was up in Wall, South Dakota a few years ago. Uh, I took the kids up there to look at the Badlands and all that. Went to the Crazy Horse Monument, did a bunch of stuff, cool stuff. Um, and then I just kept doing sketches and I talked to my students later on about how to get to different elements through the quick sketches. Also to do a bunch of stuff with color drawing and incorporate the digital tools into that as well. So the idea of how do I approach what's going on chromatically as opposed to just in terms of value. And I play around with that stuff a lot. Doing a lot of digital stuff to demonstrate how colors work. Um, I'm really passionate about uh, the color drawing course. I've built the entire curriculum over the last decade, and I really like how I can use physical analog tools and digital tools to um, get students to appreciate and apprehend color, utilizing a, f a wide range of engagement with colors, but then also understanding how digital environments are different than, than physical ones. And again, this is one of the ones that's out there in the, in the other room, in the gallery. And then also just exploration, sketching, problem solving, trying themes over and over again. Sometimes I'll be engaged with one thing, I'll print it, I'll work it. Sometimes I'll have a physical painting that I really love and I wanna try it again or try a different iteration and I'll do that.
That's me down there with lung disease. Yes, um, don't breathe in your pastels. Don't breathe in your chalk pastels for 25 years or you'll get lung disease like I did. So sketching, basic sketching. Went to uh, Indianapolis and there was a, uh, one of the uh, Terracotta Warriors was on display there and I was able to do some sketches. This is one of them. It was way back in 2014. One of my friends wanted Qui-Gon Jinn with a bowler hat on, so I did that. This is my son who really likes planets and Mars, and there's the sun up there. He's got long, lots of long hair. This is him back when he was like two. Now he's seven, his hair is very, very long. I also did these Halloween portraits of my kids. I've got four kids. Two are adopted from China, two are bio. And so I've done a lot of uh, interesting, strange. I'll talk to them about what they like, what they're interested in, and then make these portraits of them. This is an incorporation of both the photograph and then digital drawing and then bringing in other sources and asking them what they want to have happen in their portrait. It's also a way to rethink about myself. There's a famous painting by Antonio Lopez Garcia of a sink in a bathroom with this weird seam in the middle. And I was like, you know what? Maybe I can draw myself as if I'm in, the, in that same situation. I was born without the ability for enamel to bond in my teeth, so I have no real teeth. So every once in a while, I like to pop out my uh, dentures and freak people out. So this is me, crazy hair. Why, why did I do it? I don't know. Why do we do anything? Who knows? Here's another one. Uh, one, of, one of my favorite things about the COVID era is that I get to wear a, I get to wear a freaking mask so people don't have to look at my nasty neck. I have like a George Lucas neck. You guys ever seen George Lucas? He's got like a person living in his neck. I feel like that, sort of. Uh, here's Black Phillip from uh, The Witch, one of my favorite movies recently. A couple of my friends hanging out, talking about uh, things, and uh, I decided to do a portrait of us hanging out with Black Phillip. So again, it's just like fun, engagement, sketching while you're doing stuff, thinking about what's going on. But then the more serious stuff happens, where I'm, I'm planning and staging and building the workflow, you know, of how I get from A to B to C to Q to F back again, right? Either as a substrate or precursor to a finalized work or as the main event. One of the main things that I've worked on over the years is a series of paintings that are about Kunduz, Afghanistan, where we bombed a Doctors Without Borders hospital because we made a mistake, which is what happens when you're at war, which is what's happening right now in Ukraine. People are dying for no reason. So this was a hospital where there were no enemy combatants. We just firebombed them. There was a lot of documentation that came out of um, Afghanistan at the time, F photographic documentation and video documentation. And what I did is I went through and I made about 50 images that are impossible interiors. Impossible in the sense that um, how could an event like this happen? It's a hospital. There's no enemy combatants, yet we blew them up. It's impossible to think of it happening. But they're also impossible in that I'm taking from the original sources, but I'm not intending to represent the, the specific location. Like I'm removing the bodies for the most part and things like that. Um, so I made a whole bunch of these images, and I've, and I've uh, shown them in several shows around the country. They're, they're amalgamations. They are digital reconstructions from the videos that demonstrate real places, but they're also kind of impossible to view from that location. You'll often see a situation where, you know, uh, a floor will not line up with where something like there's a window here, but there's a floor here. I'll intentionally sort of subvert how it looks. This is a combination of multiple views inside a space. Um, this is the only body that I depicted in the series. Again, two different sides of the room, which I then bifurcate and crimp together. Um, so these are real locations, real situations of what happened, but I'm recreating the scenes. In this specific situation in the operating theater, a person that they were operating on when the bombing started, they had to evacuate and the guy died right there on the table. Um, and they had to leave him there. So in the actual footage of the scene, he's laying there dead. 
So I'm, I'm, I was really interested in how the, the documentary footage, which was all digital, it was from phones, it was from you know, some actual uh, cameras, which then went up onto Twitter and went up onto LiveLeak and a bunch of different places online, becomes the substrate, the digital substrate for creating imagery that documents the, the toll of that situation, the mood of that situation in direct ways. Another thing that I like to do is take, speaking of this idea of taking substrates and transforming them or making elements that, that basically become digital and then the digital element comes back out into the world. So this is a sort of sigil, which is about the creation's uh, fiat, right? The hand of God comes out of the cloud, the cloud of unknowing, and speaks light or the worlds into existence, right? And there's a variety of esoteric symbology going on around here. This actually came from a book. One of my friends works at a, an antiquarian bookshop and saw this and thought of me. And I said, well, that's pretty darn cool. So I took it and then I inverted it and then combined them from both directions to talk about the idea of both and. Can, can the voice of God be both and and not just? Can, can it be non-binary? Can it, can it be beyond one way? Can it, can it be beyond unilateral? And so in that way, all of the, all the symbols become chaotic and mixed, and yet we still see the finger pointing out in both directions here. So this actually became a, a file, a, an SVG file that I imported into my CNC router and cut a, a large wood block and then went into the printmaking lab and printed out an addition. So from a book that's 500 years old to a digital format, which was then edited, to a file which is then cut on the CNC router and then made physical again as a print. Um, another thing that I did over the course of the pandemic was play around with some more of these images. I, I saw a few of these things and I said, hmm, let's play around with it some more. So I actually took that original Fiat image and I recontextualize it, rebuilt it digitally, and then cut it again. So this is a side view, so you can see the depth on it. So again, I'm just using this old print-made book plate to make a digital image, which I then cut through. And then this becomes kind of a, uh, it was, I did a whole bunch of them. They're kind of amusing on the pandemic. So I'm really interested in how a physical thing comes out of this digital environment. So a lot of my work now, more contemporarily, is built on sketches that I was doing digitally way back in the day. You know, this is 2012, 13, 14. I was starting to utilize the iPad to do a lot of this different work. And even just using the note uh, tool, right? The note tool. I was just making these drawings. This is one of the drawings I made with the note tool. But I started to get really excited, and there's a whole logic behind some of my abstract work, which I'm not going to go into because there's not time for that. I, I got really excited about the potential for something that seemed very digital natively to start to become physical. And I started to explore it and play around with it some more. And um, I also started to incorporate a lot more apps that would do some vector imaging and what, then I began to overlay, so I would make multiple passes, some drawing back in, some cutting out, some taking that vectored image and then relaying it over the top, and then printing them out and playing with them. So a lot of this stuff started to dovetail with my interest in the CNC router and my interest in laser cutting and X and Y plotting, which started to come up at the same time, because a lot of this kind of hatching comes up when you start to explore some of those environments. Just because of the way that X and Y plotting is done, oftentimes they use fills, which are literally just lines. Those fills started to be very interesting to me as subject matter, as formal structures. These are all, the ones I've showed you are still all digital, but I'm starting to combine these multiple modes. And then eventually they come out into the world. So, you know, years ago when I would work in the nursery at church, I would do, you know, crayon drawings trying to sort of see what would come from physically making some of the types of marks and some of the types of maneuvers in chromatic environments 
that I was seeing digitally? Could I, could I make them function in a similar way? And then eventually I brought them into um, my X and Y plotter. So this is, you know, it, it's just a, a 3D printed and then there's some hardware tools and there's a uh, this small chipset here. You can actually find out more about it. If you Google Mad, Evil Mad Scientist X and Y plotter, you can find out. They're not expensive, right? They take very little expertise, <clears throat> but I basically do these drawings, which I had been doing in the note program or in you know, variations on programs like Procreate, but now I'm doing them in a program called Inkscape in my computer, which is a free vector-based program. You can do all kinds of stuff with it that Illustrator would do, but it outputs to my X and Y plotter. And so I can do a drawing in the computer and then put in a specific pen, put in a specific thickness of pen, color of pen, or alcohol marker, paint marker, whichever, and I can start to layer these things. So getting what I was doing back here, but getting it in a very physical way, in a very direct way. So this is what the input on um, Inkscape looks like. Basically, you're building layers of hatch fills like this, which then you overlay. And, you, you know, there's a little bit of, you can be super anal about it and get very, very strong registration, or you can be much more fluid and open with it. For me, it's almost like going back to the 80s, like music concrete, you know, or, or uh, Bukowski with cut poetry, where you're allowing the glitches to come through. You're allowing the places where it breaks to come through. So I'm getting elements like this, where there's very, very tight weaves, complex color situations. I also started to do, uh, I, I, I manufactured a, a tool that would hold markers and paintbrushes for my CNC router so I could do larger images, because my X and Y plotter will only do, I can basically do about 14 by 14 inches. But with this, I can do up to like 36 inches, <clears throat> 40 inches. So I'm able to do much larger explorations. And so there's some aspects of it are similar and some aspects of it are different. But in terms of that iterative process, right, this was all done on my X and Y plotter. And then I scanned it into the computer and I worked back into it in Procreate. So I'm going back and forth between these multiple modes, uh, multiple approaches to try to discover something in the image. And you may be thinking to yourself, man, how, how is it that you do representational painting, representational art, but you also do this abstract stuff? This is, this is something I've been doing since day one, since the very beginning, because all, like fundamentally, composition is abstract and color is abstract. And in a lot of ways, all of our perceptions are abstract since we don't have all the information. We see a very, very limited aspect of the electromagnetic spectrum. So we're very, very concerned with certainty all the time, but the reality is, is that we see very little bit. There's not a lot that's certain. And so in many ways, what I'm doing is exploring compositional and chromatic and dynamic compositions, um, the visual dynamics of those compositions in very similar ways. Sometimes it comes out as representational. Sometimes it comes out as more abstract. Again, they just get, get very, um, to me, they become very, very interesting because of the, the sort of shimmering or scintillating fields of color, which are very transparent. You can make them opaque, but I like to make them very transparent. These are sometimes up to 40 layers. You know, sometimes it's just one pass. Sometimes it's multiple passes. But inside Inkscape, I'm building many layers which are then le registered or deregistered to create each work. And a lot of what I'm doing is thinking about archetypal forms or suggestive forms, forms that relate to, for instance, how we understand ideas of symbols for language or symbols for numbers, things like that. I also do, in terms of my um, classes, even way back here, I started making videos for people to see passageways of how to build through. So just like in class, I'd be working from the model or I'd be working from even students because the students would be drawing each other. And I would help them see through how I was building and give them strategies. Also dealing with how people change over time, how light changes, how positions change in space. 
And I think that in a lot of ways, this kind of action, being able to see it in person, see it come up in real time, kind of helps the student understand choices. So this back, this is years and years ago where I'm doing it very rudimentarily with like one tool and I'm just seeing it through, right? I'm just changing the value on the tool. But as I go, I start to get more complex and there are different types of drawings that I'm doing. And uh, I, it was also important too to show students that things can change. So, you know, I had, she had changed position slightly and eyes had changed position, hair had changed position. And I, and I was trying to explain to the students that that's, that's part of what we do. It's, you know, making drawings, making paintings is not a snapshot. We have cameras for that. It's, it's for the experience over time of what's happening in the world. And so part of what I would do is try to demonstrate the, the temporal quality of it. And here's a clip of the CNC in action. Again, kind of sped up. I use it to make frames. I use it to make table things, elements. I use it to make surfaces for me to paint on. I use it to carve in images and you know, do like uh, bas relief into drawings and paintings, all kinds of stuff like that. Any questions or concerns, fears, hopes, dreams? I'd love to hear from you. I had to try to curtail it because I do so much digitally now that I tried to just give you that kind of overview of those sort of three arenas. But essentially it's seamless now. I mean, I work, every single aspect of my work goes through an iterative process that's digital. As, and that includes teaching, that includes everything that I do it has, is incorporated that way. Questions, thoughts? The first thing I plotted on it was a, was a uh, Renaissance drawing that I had vectored. I find that I, the granular detail that I would want to use to make a representational image is not quite where I would want it to be. I do do it, but I often do it as, a, as, a, as something that I'll work back into. So I'll draw back over the top of it after I've built it. But I do primarily the abstract work on there. I go back and forth. Recently I did, I did a bunch of, um, one of my friends in Chicago is a, a wood carver and he, he's, he's passionate about acanthus leaves, which is a traditional thing it's around frames, it's, it's ornamentation that's you know, all over the world. But I actually did a, made a bunch of acanthus leaves um, and transformed them a bit, and then he went in and carved them. So, I mean, we do representational things as well, but not as much that way. Uh, I mean, I think that there are differences, but I, I, one of the things that happens, I was telling actually one of the students I met with earlier that um, form is never neutral. And another aspect of that is form always has a narrative. Form is always has something to say. Color always has something to say. There's always a mood. There's always a structure of some sort, which is the reason why those things are so powerful to us and how we are influenced by them and everything from the way that a film looks in its color, in its mood, to the way advertising works on us and gets us to buy things. But in terms of my own work, I would say that sometimes the visual dynamic will push me more toward the abstract. Other times it will, it will remain very much in the representational realm. But generally, I, I kind of know at the beginning, but, I don't, but I'm willing to change it. Now, that's one of the biggest things that I've learned say, as a more mature artist in the last 15 years is I give myself permission. Like, there's no, there's no failures. There's no, nothing is broken. It's, you know, nobody's dying because I make a picture, quote unquote, wrong, right? So I try to keep myself open to trying things in different ways and doing things in different ways. But, but in general, I really do, I'm totally committed to the idea that on a compositional level, abstract and figurative work, are the, it's the same thing. Just the same thing as things are going on. People are very caught up in subject matter, but you, we are motivated by the subtext of life that is very much abstract, whether it's you know, oral through sound, whether it's visual through the big shaping that we see in the world. I mean, a, a large portion of our sub-brain just perceives values and just perceives big discontinuities in the visual field. 
we're so used to talking about everything in granular detail that actually we mistake the fact that most of what we're processing is big abstract shapes, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I mean, I think that there are, there's, there's aspects of any kind of work that should be received almost subconsciously. And it doesn't mean that there's not an overt point or an overt, you know, fact of what is supposed to go, supposed to go on. But I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a romanticist, I guess, in the, in the sense that I think the way that Umberto Eco did about the idea that there's an intention to the, the artist or the writer or the filmmaker or the musician, and there's an intention that comes from the work itself over time. And there's also the intention of the viewer or the listener or the hearer or the reader. Those three things work together to build the meaning of the work. Mona Lisa means something totally different now than it meant to Leonardo. Leonardo could not understand what Mona Lisa means to us today, right? I mean, think about like, like Jay-Z and Beyonce standing in front of the Mona Lisa. It means something different to them. The conception of why they're there is completely different than what it meant for Leonardo to make that. And so that's, that's a clear situation where the intention of the artist, the intention of the work, and the intention of the viewers is, is different, but they all supplement and they correspond. So I'm not one of these people that says, well, everybody can just get whatever they want out of everything. But I do acknowledge that everybody does get whatever they want out of everything. <laughs> So, like, I do try to control people to some degree in as much as I'm trying to control myself. Like, in the works that I'm making, I'm trying to control my own view. I'm trying to think about my own view. But I, I do have a method. Like, when I do paintings of the fact that we bombed the hell out of these doctors and killed a bunch of people, yeah, I have a point to do that. Is it the same kind of point as my abstract work? No, it's a different point. It doesn't mean it make it better or worse. I mean, music is very abstract and yet it can be very powerful as a motivational force. But, you know, it's not gonna have the same point as someone writing an essay saying, please do this. It's, there are very different logics and it's okay for there to be multiple different types of logics that exist at the same time. I think it does. There, there was actually a really interesting project that was done with a very, spe it was an internet connected, um, X and Y plotter that deposited sand into, and it would create a portrait with the sand, and then the sand would get dumped off. And you didn't have to know anything about how to make the image. You didn't need to know anything about X and Y plotting. You didn't even have to do anything other than just like be able to upload an image, which is fairly, you know, in some sense that's constrained, but in another way that's democratic process in today's world. I found it really poignant and beautiful that that you know, over and over and over again, people were uploading these photographs of their loved ones and the, the, the X and Y plotter would make it and then it would dump it off and make another one. And they'd recycle the sand for every single one. That kind of ephemerality is interesting to it. In terms of, like, I love the hand. I love my hand. I love the signature of my hand. All, every single one of us, the way that we walk, the way that we drive, the way that we uh, move through the world is very unique. And at the same time, like, even though I love my hand, I, I want to subvert it or, or, or jack it around or body check it in some way. And so I view a lot of my drawings that I do with the, the, the robot as being extremely physical and, and being very deeply engaged with my hand. But at the same time, my hand could never make those marks. So I, I think it's important that I'm making something that I could not make. I did plan it, I did draw it, but, I, but I, I could not physically. All the lines that I've made with that X and Y plotter over the last five years, there's like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of lines. Like I could not have physically drawn them in the amount of time that I've had. So I'm utilizing that technology to do more than what I could do with my own hand. But what it's doing is, it, is it's giving me options. It's giving me different options. And it's also giving me ways to engage with people that maybe wouldn't like the other way. So, I don't know. I've been, I've been trying to get, get both more out of my hand and less out of my hand for my entire time being an artist, so. And that goes to like hyper rendering and, and being, you know, using Renaissance techniques all the way up to not even being in the process at all other than the idea. So I've kind of 
been on that range. Um, I actually did a project with, um, with Chris years ago where we worked online, completely separated. There were people all over the country. Everybody's drawing on the same drawings at the same time in this digital space. They were weird and, and stupid and amazing and profound, very kind of poetic and very painterly, but also completely devoid and they only exist in, they only existed on those boards, right? I, I saved them, I saved a bunch of them. If you ever wants to see, I don't know if you saved them. <laughs> but they were really interesting to see like people who were untrained and people who were trained and people who cared about representation and people who didn't coming together all and just chaotically like building these scenes. There are ways that we can all do that stuff. But I, I mean, I also do like the portraits for the All-Americans at Mizzou. So I'm like, I'm like using digital tools to make pictures of football players, you know? And then, and I'm like, yes, All-American, buddy, let's do it. I, I'm fine with it. I, I digitally paint them, I, I, I digitally collage them, and then it comes out into the world and then I physically paint into it. And then it's hanging up over at the football stadium. I have to get the athletic money somehow. <laughs> Thanks.